Good morning, afternoon or evening, and welcome to the Hayseed Night, where Adder needs to find his friend and uh, see that they are okay. So, uh, let's see what happens with the search. Assuming she was still in the bazaar at all. Finally! I thought that fluffy bastard was never leaving. Joff walked into the scene with a huge smile as the giant disappeared in the distance. Afternoon, Mr. Bard. Oh, lad, what a face. Well, see, it's a long... Ah, not a word. Thy mean speaketh clearer than thy tongue doeth. You're hungry. No, I ain't in the mood to... Well, I am. And I can't play a song when my stomach's growling a gazelle. Let's get some fried leaves. Sorry, Bard. I ain't got time for any of that. I gotta go look for Aina. She just ran away angry as all get out, and I know darn well if I don't go check up on her, no one's gonna... And I thought my songs were monothematic. Geoff picked the strings of his... Ood, one by one, deep in thought, while Adder just paced around. I know just the place to look. Geoff expertly snuck through the crowds, moving with such ease that he seemed to be little more than a shadow. Adder did his best to keep up with him, though that was hardly an easy task when he was one head taller than most other deer. The place Joff was looking for wasn't in the plaza itself, surrounded by stalls and all their merchandise, but rather on one of the many alleys that led to the bazaar. The crowd there was bustling with life as well, but not quite in the same manner. They were all rowdy deer, pushing and cheering. A Carnme Alley Karnme alleys were very different from the official sort. While killing was still very much frowned upon, there was no chivalry, no one set, no one set of rules. There was no way of knowing if the horns you were being gored with were hygienic. There were punches and kicks and all sorts of cheats. It was chaos. And for that and several other reasons, Aina was a huge fan of unofficial Karnme. Sadly, as much as Adder jumped and pushed and yelled, she wasn't anywhere to be found. Alas, your fair maiden is in another alley. Adder cast a long glance over the improvised battlegrounds, attempting to find her one last time. That's too bad. Man, it kicks some serious ass here. Good thing she's not allowed to fight. Yeah, ain't no way they're gonna let a doe. A golem at her. Geoff cast a very serious look in his direction. This wasn't the first time they'd had this discussion, and it wouldn't be the last. How many times do I gotta tell you? Aina is not a golem, okay? She's a doe. It's just she's alba... Alba... A bit of a weirdo. Weirdo. Right. Tell me, Adder dearest, how many albino does can you name off the top of your head that can lift your heavy butt with just one hand? Aina! Now let's go! We gotta find her! <sighs> Why do I even bother? Look at her. Gollum or not, she's just a little cabbage head hiding in the crowds of this enormous city. She's damn good at hiding. And do you know why people hide? Because uh -huh. they don't want to be found. Geoff extended his arms towards him in a dramatic manner, remarking how correct he was. 
You're not gonna find her. So why don't you go and use your thick skull for something useful? Like bringing us money so we can have dinner for once. Dove pointed at the ring with his horns, and Adder knew better than to insist. With a heavy sigh, Adder nodded and began walking towards the ringmaster. Ah, wait, there's just one more thing. Your bag of coins. You wouldn't want to lose what little we have to the hands of, say, some ill-intentioned crook, now would you? Uh-huh. Better the evil you know, right? Jeff extended his hand a bit too keenly, waiting for Adder to find the purse he usually hid within his sash. But... Whoa, Bard! <laughs> you're... you're really gonna bust the gut laughing! Don't tell me you lost it! It was the mystery woman, for sure. She took Adder's purse. I, uh... Alrighty then. Jeff's scrawny body trembled like a branch about to snap off. Just... go. Alright! See that sweaty black head over there with the glistening fur and that charming smile? That's your foe. I'll go place my bet now. Are you feeling like a winner, ladder? Charming? Oh, hold up! You mean the guy with them sharpened horns? Oh, darn, B Bard. Your confidence in this poorly put-together row is much appreciated, but as much as it hurts me, and it does... I think I'd rather go to bed hungry today. What? What if he hits me in the face? I don't want to go from out of the one-eyed to out of the no-eyed! Then do enlighten me, my boy, on how in the name of the hat, sir, do you pretend to become a knight if you can't handle even a rat pointed at you? No wonder you can't even catch a hint, yellow piece of mangy venison. <sighs> Him. Sorry about that. What are you mumbling there, Gyoff? I said I'm going to walk you through this. So, oh, help me three if you mess up. Hey, look this Darwin. And a girl, you sure eat your veggies. But all the sticks on your forehead, I can't fool anyone. <laughs> if he's serious. This is gonna be easier than I thought. <gasps> wait, 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 there's a fight coming up! Holy horns, you have to tell me everything about it! What kind of fighting style did Adder use? Was it antler rattling? He was a rattler, right? Did he prefer grappling or thrusting? Or was he more of a brawler instead? Swish, swish, bam! Pushing them right in the... Wait, did they even have any hand wraps his size? Give me a moment. I think I have to sneeze. What were any of those words? I don't really know the rules of Karnme. I thought you just had to hit people until they fainted. Oh god, nothing I can come up with is going to live up to her expectations. I can't deal with the pressure. Ah, uh, You... You said you knew the knight like the palm of your hand, didn't you? The new bearer of a tale of this magnitude should be able to pen a memorable fight scene all on their own. If that's the case, prove you're worthy of your name, Lin. Oh my god, you're right! Yes, this is my moment to shine! Leave it to me! <laughs> nice save, narrator. Yes, good. I shall go and, uh leave you to it so as not to influence you. Let's see, what would the knight do? Right, he needed a few tips first. So Gyov took Adder aside and held him under his arm. He said, Adder, mine lad, tis a dangerous fight that awaits us. But if not in the strength of thy body, I believe it in the strength of thine heart. 
What with thee saith is the greatest feat a fighter should at each moment striveth for. Well, diggity yee haw, Bard! What a tootin' rootin' mighty fine question that is! Adder nodded thoughtfully to himself and then continued, I reckon that would be. Honor. Honor, as expected of a knight, dearest friend. Thou shalt be a rattler then. Ah, honorable style amongst honorable styles. The way our ancestors squareth, where two deer shalt proveth the might of their horns rather than that of their mind. But hoy, bard, yelped Adder. Mine horns are so teenly tiny. Yelf smirked. This is where your strength lieth, mine otter. There is an advantage to short horns, thou see. No one shalt be able to lock their horns around yours to grapple thee to the ground. Your advice is now run wise, Yof. This is why I love you so daringly dearly. Uh, otter, you beautiful boar. Everyone will find out if thou keepest talking so loud. We mustn't. Let the whole world bask in the warmth of our passion. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> she certainly has her own style of telling the story. A bit different from the narrator's. Oh, Adder! Smooch! Smooch! Smoochy! Smooch! Ahem. <clears throat> Lynn, how's that scene going? Adder found himself alone at last, his dearest friend lost to the blurry tides of people surrounding the ring. Veins were starting to pop in his eye, making it even harder to see anything except the stag waiting in front of him. The deer with sharp horns smirked in his drunken haze, clearly looking down on Adder. It wasn't the first time someone pitied him and lived to regret it as the drunkard would soon learn. The ringmaster looked left and right, making sure that both fighters knew that they were about knew what they were about to get into. He lifted his hand carefully as he stepped back and then Go! he screamed with a hand chop. Mm. I mean We've got short horns, and uh, they've got large ones, so I'm thinking we want to get up close and personal, uh, so that they can't use their horns, but we can use ours, or Black Adder can use, you know, yeah. So I'm thinking we'll charge in order to get up close and personal. This was no time to hesitate. Both the row and his opponent rushed towards each other head first, heeding the scream of an ancient instinct that boiled in their bloods. Every voice in the alley fell silent once the deer slammed into each other, horns singing a threatening melody as they rattled fiercely in a never-ending battle for dominance. Never ending? Uh oh. The tension could be cut with a knife as their foreheads pushed against each other, but Geoff's advice proved unerring indeed. As much as he tried, the bigger deer could not intertwine his antlers around adders, short and straight ones. Uh, now what? The answer is clear, of course. A barrage of swift punches to the other deer's face would have sent his brain bouncing all over his skull. It would have been an obvious choice to anyone with deer-sized hands, um, uh, to any honorless ruffian. Refusing to even consider such lowly tactics, our hero decided to take the moral high ground. And the physical, too. Tired of this pointless dance, the deer pushed Adder back with a swift head movement. Before Adder had a chance to react, 
his bow slammed his head just below the roe's chest, knocking all the air out of him and lifting him right off the ground with ease. Uh oh. Adder flailed his one free arm and legs most valiantly, but there was little he could do in such a compromising position, worn out as he was after trying to uphold his honor as a brave warrior with such a direct approach. And crack. I could not tell if that was the sound of Adder's neck or Adder's teeth as his face hit the ground at full speed. But little did that matter, for nothing lay more broken than his dreams. Ah. Ah. Um. Try again. Adder. Uh, okay, yeah, so it's, it's, um, starting from this, where we need to make the choice. The deer smirks and is drunken. And the ringmaster screams go. And I guess we'll wait. The towering deer charged towards Adder like a runaway fur, horns aligned and ready to slam into him with the full force of a Makedar stampede. But the road didn't move a single muscle. Adder merely waited, silencing all the voices that screamed at him to run and die. He didn't even assume the step rider's stance. He just waited, closing his eyes, lest the sight of his incoming enemy would betray his nerve. And when the time was right... Well, I mean, when the time is right, we grapple, right? When he's close enough that he can't use his horns? Adder opened his arms wide, mentally prepared and ready for the incoming attack. Or so he thought. The deer slammed his head into Adder's stomach, nearly sending him to the ground with a single well-placed blow. But when all seemed lost, Adder managed to stand his ground, rapidly holding on to his bow's horns. Well, I mean, uh, this isn't exactly what I had in mind, but okay. Adder's foe smirked. By the time our hero realized he'd fallen into a trap, his whole body was hovering several arms over the ground. Okay. The carrot strikes back. What a foul move! He would have turned Otter into a strainer if the yellow deer had had a single bite's worth of meat in his body. If that had been the case to begin with, he would have been able to struggle against his enemy's hold as he flew across the sky. Or at least he would have been serene enough to come up with a different approach to the situation. But for now, face to the pavement it is. Okay, well I'm clearly not on the same wavelength with the uh, game developer here. Let's get back into the action. So we gotta wait. And then we gotta wait some more. He realized that there was no such thing as a right time when one has absolutely no idea what to do next. Adder waited and waited, hoping that some divine inspiration would strike him. Oh, 
Oops, wrong button, sorry. But the only thing that struck him was a brick wall as he flew all the way across the alley and right past any chance of ever amounting to anything in his life. So all the choices were wrong. <laughs> Think it over. After such a shameful defeat, the writer decided to take a page from Adder's book, literally. She began writing these words as a means to stall her own anxiety as she tried to understand how she managed to dig herself into such a narrative hole. She had certainly made a mistake somewhere. It was obvious to her prodigious mind that a boy so preoccupied with doing what was good and true and right would hardly be willing to do whatever it took to stand victorious and carve a space for himself in the annals of history. Our wonderful narrator started to realize that perhaps she had misunderstood something about Adder, for she could picture no scenario where a well-meaning and upstanding street fighter could ever get past his first night in Slander District. Oma Lindibili of Askedaz, true descendant of the night, decided to revisit her decision, thinking more deeply about what kind of priorities her ancestor would have. I mean, survival, but I guess victory in this case, would be the uh, priority in a fight. Ah, so thou art a brawler, dearest friend. I have indeed taught it you well. There is no honor in death. If thine horns will not aid you in battle, use those hands the gods gave you. Bummel them to the ground. Thou shalt win this fight and prevail until the next. But hoy, bard, yelped at her. My hands are so bogglingly big! Yuff smirked. All the better to swat their faces away. If they trieth to thrust towards thee with their large horns, thou shalt only need to slap them into the ground. Stand victorious over those who would hurt you, my natter. And then they smooched again, but quietly. <laughs> okay. So we're back uh, here at the start of the fight. Our opponent smirks in our, di well, adder's direction. And uh, then the ringmaster yells go or screams go. And oh, what do we do? We want to get up close and personal. So uh, we're going to charge, but we're going to get in like under his horns. We're not going to meet his horns, but we're going to duck under them. Is this the... Uh, really? We're going to have the same thing as we did the first time? Four heads pushed against each other. Deer pushed at her back. And at her flailed his one free arm and leg, but uh, there was nothing he could do. And... Uh, he fell to the ground. We already kind of established that rushing in wouldn't be the smartest choice for a long neck short horn slain. But... Well... Clearly... Me... Or I and the, uh, the uh, game writer here are on very different wavelengths. Yeah, yeah. 
so I guess we wait. And the other one charges, and we wait. And when the time is right, we grapple. Adder opened his arms wide, mentally prepared and ready for the incoming attack. Oh. Adder manages to stand his ground, but it is a trap and um, Adder is sent flying. And, uh... Indeed, this adder was nothing more than a hungry fawn who wanted nothing more than to go back home and hide. His life was a constant fight to find more scraps. And yet, this boy would become, one day, the greatest knight that Agazor has ever known. But to reach the heights that awaited him, he had to live another day. Surviving isn't always the most honorable path, but it is the path we choose in this house. At first, there was silence. Then, roaring laughter and... throats and jeers. The drunk deer needed a moment to realize that they were being directed at him. He reached down to pull up his pants as best they could, hastily hurling Adder away after his dirty trick. Still hold holding his foe's belt, Adder fell on his massive hands, barely managing to keep his head over the ground to avoid a shameful defeat after he'd already stooped so low. His foe was distracted, what now? Uh, roundhouse kick or taunt? Let's try the roundhouse kick. Emboldened by his spectacular success, Adder lowered his body over his hands like a spring and launched himself into a flying kick. And promptly fell on the ground face first, breaking his snout on the pavement, because obviously this isn't that kind of story, Lynn. Sheesh, fine. Taunt him. Well aware of the direness of this situation and the nullness of his pride, Adder decided that if he had nothing to lose anymore, he may as well go down in flames. Our protagonist called out to his opponent, loudly mocking him as he jumped from hand to hand, making a fool out of both. The drunk deer turned around, red in shame and fury, he swore enraged and charged towards Adder once more. Overlooking the tiny little fact that his pants were still down. The whole alley watched in silence as Adder's foe fell obstreperously into the ground to the ground. But out and everything. Our protagonist stared blankly ahead as he got up. His expression as unreadable as that of the public. It was pretty clear that this was a victory of sorts. Yeah, but uh, no one was saying anything. After a few uncomfortable harumphs, the ringmaster scratched the back of his head, looked around vehemently, and then proceeded to kindly pull up the drunkard's pants before screaming, down. And so, Adder emerged victorious, winning the fight on his own terms, questionable and messy as they may be, 
and living to see another day. Wait, so he wins? Of course he wins. He's the knight, you doof. Of course he wins. He's the knight, you doof. Oops, I guess uh, <laughs> I had the cursor on replay by accident. I, uh, right. Never mind then. Well done, Lin. <laughs> I'm pretty great, yes. Now, what's this torn page you're trying to hide behind your back? Wait, don't! So, anyway... Whoa, I can't believe it! Still alive and kicking! <laughs> Come on, show me the money, Bard! I wanna bite every single coin! I completely forgot to place the bet! <laughs> Jeff covered his face with his hands, making some sort of unintelligible noise that can only be described as the very sound of anguish. Hey, big ad, I want to learn some tips too. <laughs> I'll buy you dinner. Hey now, sir, you really think you're going to steal my manager away, so... Jeff shot at her snout with one hand. My dear boy, you sure gave it all today, so why don't you go and enjoy what's left of the fair? I have a gig in the tavern later. <laughs> Money, yes. Don't expect me tonight. With that, Jeff hurriedly shooed a very confused adder away. Our protagonist wandered back towards the increasingly empty and silent plaza, unsure of where he was headed next. Well, I'm thinking we'll continue the story from here in the next episode. Ah, uh, see what adventures befall Adder. Ah, uh, after the uh, fight. So, um, I'm going to read a bit of the encyclopedia once again. So, if you're not into that, you can stop watching this episode here. And uh, if you are like me and want to know more about the world and its customs and history and characters and stuff, then uh, keep on watching because um, we are going to get into i think we're going to get didn't we read about the seasons last time why isn't it showing as red didn't we read about the magic as well and beasts and golems i mean we've read all of these right uh Flower Sands, Dawn Soon, Bleak Night, right? We read that last time. And the uh, Sephi Head we read as well. Yeah. And we read about the Beasts as well. And we read about the golems, too. Right. So, uh, we're going to get into religion now. And uh, we'll read about a few things. We'll start from the beginning here. And then we'll read a few things and a few more in the next episode and so on. Um, yeah. So, by Tatsa the Hatsa. And Oblivion. By Tatsa is, simply put, the cosmos, the all. It is an entity that connects the universe together. It is not seen as a god in any way, but rather as an unconscious entity. The very essence of reality. Everything that surrounds us and holds existence together. 
often represented as an empty box. While some regional cults speak of Bai Tadze being created by other gods, more traditional views maintain that Bai Tadze is in charge of providing every god with a sandbox in which to exercise their powers. The Hatsa The union between Bai Tadze and Dakna is known as Hatsa, a current that passes through every living being connected with their very blood. Every being blocks the stream that passes through them to some degree, but only those that know the ways of Sefihet can truly tap into the current and block it completely, gathering more and more Hatsa behind them as they live. This makes them wise and powerful, but it weighs down on them, uh, eroding their bodies and minds away little by little. Once every being dies, the current continues its path like a furious torrent, carrying some of the previous blocker's strength to be passed on to the next creature that it was fated to inhabit. In this way, all the bloodlings are connected to each other and no two living people can be part of the same current. Oblivion The polar opposite of opposite is oblivion, so the polar opposite of Hatsa. Uh, bloodlings believe that having their connection to the Hatsa erased somehow is the worst punishment possible, since they and any creature that would have been connected to them would cease to exist in any way. Only the worst criminals and Cephis are contem condemned to oblivion, the complete erasure of not only your person, but the very memory of you, a sentence to be apart from the world for all of the lives that may share your current. Every curse or otherwise ill-meaning Cephihet as their basis on this concept, an alteration to your connection to the Hatsa. If, you're if you encounter small gods or cursed people, take a moment to pity them, for it's really their fault that they became either. Okay. Existence after death. In the world of Dakna, Life is celebrated for as long as it lasts, but death is not wept with much ardor. Life is borrowed from the future and taken from the past. It is therefore understood that death is an eventuality, but not a permanent state of the soul, for it is something borrowed from the universe itself. The punishment for Sefihet is to be burned in life, in an attempt to have all future lives remember the suffering that comes from stealing from the future. Okay, so this is then this is like history, right? First age, fourth age, second age. Yeah. First age, the war of two. The world of Dakna was entrusted to Ahimai originally. He decided to turn it into a vast garden that he could watch over and modify to his own tastes. During a long nap, his younger brother Baitat snuck into his garden and began adding his own creations to it. At first, he carved figures out of marble, more puppets that he could play with but he soon grew bored. Thus, he decided to invent a new concept, the bloodlings, weak creatures that came and went in a blink for him, changing constantly, creations that soon learned to use Ahimai's flora to grow strong and have lives of their own that Baitat could watch. First stage, the creation of the beasts. 
the first didn't take lightly to waking up to just to find most of his garden turned into a step. In a single night, he created a new species, one that would live exclusively to hunt Baidat's creations. The beasts. Not one to be bested like that, Baidat decided to create more and more deer to fight his older brother, eventually starting the cosmic equivalent of a fist fight, the War of Two. The battle came to an end when one of the beasts turned against his own kind and revealed their weakness to the deer. Baitad himself granted him immortality for that, giving Agazor its legendary high king, Isifik. Fourth Age the Barhan Rebellion. So for some reason these aren't ordered by like the number of the age. For some reason we've got fourth age next. Oh well. The sublevation of the arrogant or more commonly Barhan Rebellion started 437 years prior to the story when the representant of Hirub declared that the land of Basaxerat would no longer be independent from the kingdom of Agazor, but rather, rather replace it. Taking the title of Joseph, Omagepsep, Stonebridge, created an army of Sephis, powerful Barhan wizards, and golems that advanced dangerously fast towards heirloom. It is said that Isifik himself put an end to the war, but all sources are greatly exaggerated. Be it as it may, the war ended 30 years after its inception, and things haven't looked up for gazelles ever since. Second Age the Long Silence, so this is after the War of Two, then. Um, after the War of Two, the gods disappeared. Millennia passed without a single word from any god in a time that would be known as the Long Silence. During this time, the beast that revealed the weakness of his kind to the deer, Isifik, roamed the steppes looking to unite the deer tribes. He would go on to become the immortal High King Isifik. The Three Brothers It is said that there are many, many gods in Baitatse. Akazor's mainstream religion, however, recognizes only three of them as protectors of Dakna. The Brothers or the Three. Ahimai, also known as the first, the oldest brother, or forester, creator of all the plants and all the beasts, extensively worshipped in sacred gardens in the city, farmers ask for his blessing in every harvest. Baitat, also known as the second, the middle brother, or dear father, creator of the equine, Worshipped in the biggest temples of the cities, represented by the High King himself. Hirub, also known as the third, the youngest brother, or the fervent, creator of the Makedar and Barhan, once greatly worshipped in both Agazor and Bazaxerat, there are no func functioning temples devoted to him anymore. And then we've got the Third Age, the second creation. The long silence came to an end with the abrupt apparition of a new figure in the skies. Thus arrived Hirub, an uncharacteristically enthusiastic god that looked forward to fixing the damage caused by the War of Two. 
he was too young to create his own life forms, however, and instead decided to compose new beings out of his older brother's creations. But that wasn't enough for Hirob. He wanted his new creations to rule sovereign, thus starting the Barhan Rebellion. Alright, so that's that for uh, magic and monsters and religion and species and stuff. Uh, so basically that's that for lore. I mean, that's all we currently have here. Maybe we will have more uh, at some point in the future. Locations we've already read through as well. So, maybe next time we'll get into characters. At the end of the next episode, we'll read more about Otter, Aina, Jov, Ilegrab, Joseph, Taylid, the Knight of the Upper Field, and the Merch. Well, we'll see. Maybe we'll read about all of these, and maybe we'll only read about some of these. But anyway, that is my intention for the end of the next episode. To read more about the characters, what we've got written here. About um, at least some of them. We also have a dictionary here with uh, some terms. I guess these would be good to, to read through as well. Well, we'll see. Maybe we'll read through these at the end of the next episode and leave the characters for the end of another one. Um, but yeah, this is where I'm ending this episode and uh, we'll continue from here in the next one and uh, see what kind of an adventure Otter gets himself into next. For now, thank you so much for watching and spending a little of your time with me here today. It was lovely to have you. Please remember to be kind to yourself. Have a lovely rest of your day. And I will see you again next time. <laughs>